So, I, you know, I read this, this statement that healing and forgiveness were presented together. We've seen multiple scriptures, Psalm 103.3, Isaiah 53.5, 1 Peter 2.24, James 5.15, Luke 5.24, the paralytic who was let down through the roof, where healing and forgiveness are presented together. We've looked at the Great Commission. The bookends of the Great Commission is preach the gospel and lay hands on the sick. So we've seen these things uh, presented together in what one writer says, what God has joined together, let no man separate. How did healing and forgiveness get separated? It's, it's not in the New Testament. It's something that's happened since that time. As I, as I talked about Paul who preached in Lystra and there was a man who was lame in the crowd and it says Paul perceiving he had faith to be healed uh, he pointed at the man and told him to rise and walk. Well, how could that man have faith to be healed if Paul was just preaching a salvation-only message? If Paul was only dealing with forgiveness of sins, that man would not have had faith for his healing. And it, notice, it didn't say that God healed him automatically, instantly, that out of nowhere, this man just started jumping and leaping. No, it said Paul perceived he had faith to be healed. So there had to be some word given because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. There had to be a healing word preached in that service for that man to have faith in healing, which again proves that God put healing and forgiveness together. It's part and parcel of the gospel message and it really never should have been separated. It, it, it should have never been. And I could tell you exactly how it can start to become separate is that uh, uh, somebody who has good intentions, they care about people, a preacher or a believer prays for someone who's sick and they die. Well, that, you know what, that does happen. And it has happened. And that can really intimidate a person to say, well, you know what, we don't need to really talk about this too much because we, we failed. And, and, and we shouldn't have that attitude. Uh, there are a lot of factors involved as to why someone may not receive their healing, but none of them are big enough or important enough for us to stop preaching the healing message. We need to present it. Probably we need to double up on it and, and do more of it so we can be more successful. Uh, you know, and that's one of the objections people have with the healing ministry. And they'll, they'll come to people like me. Now, believe me, I'm not preaching healing because I'm some kind of healing evangelist. I'm preaching healing because I can't overlook it. It's just glaring at us throughout the New Testament, throughout the Bible. And to be fair and honest... With my revelation, you know we're stewards of the mysteries of God. We've been given this revelation to, to be caretakers of it. I can't in good conscience not preach healing. But I don't feel like I'm a healing minister. But, but they'll look at people like me and they'll say, you believe in healing. You believe it's God's will to heal. Yes, yes. Well, then why don't you go to the hospital and just get them all healed? And that is, it sounds logical, sounds like a great argument, like, ooh, he got you there. But it, it just doesn't hold water. There's many, many reasons that someone doesn't receive their healing. God's not out automatically healing every person that we touch. That's not how faith works. That's not how the gospel works. You could tell these same people, because they believe in salvation, they just don't want to deal with healing because of the you know because of the issues that arise when you when you deal with healing you got to go through it i mean you have to you have to walk through it with people and that's why we've done 15 sessions on simply where does sickness and disease come from and 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 is this part of our redemption is this part of what we need to really believe for or is it just just something additional and so uh, you could tell these same people who want to criticize us and say, well, why don't you just go to the hospital and, and heal everyone? You could, tell, you could ask them, same reason you can't go to the jail and save everyone. You preach salvation. You believe that's God's will for everyone, but you can't go to the jail and just get everyone saved just because you believe it's God's will and you preach it. 
because they have a part to play. They have to accept it and receive it. And so they have all kinds of excuses why not everyone they preach to gets saved, but they don't allow that for those of us who preach and practice healing. Um, they think that it's all or nothing. You should get everyone healed or, or it's just not working. And that's not the way to look at it. You know, God didn't tell me to make sure every person gets healed. He said for me to lay hands on the sick. And uh, that's all I can do. I can't heal anyone, but I can lay hands on the sick. And I can tell them what Jesus has done for them in the gospel. And, uh, and so it's, it's just, you know, the healing message has really been beaten up. And, and it's been oppressed or suppressed. And we've got to get it back out in front and take the criticism that goes with it. Um, you know, Jesus, Jesus took the criticism, and, and so we shouldn't be uh, timid, so timid that we're afraid to preach the truth because someone might not like it. Man, I tell you what, there's a lot of sick people out there that would love to hear this message, and it's not getting to them because we don't have a lot of help in getting it out. And so... Um, you know, thank God for the voices that are out there. But if you compare the voices today to 40 years ago, uh, we just don't have a lot of help with this. Um, back in the good old days, um, there was a lot of preachers that majored on the message of healing. Um, they said T.L. Osborne preached to more people in person than any person that's ever lived. And he had healing crusades all over the world. Oral Roberts had the biggest tent uh, healing minist tent ministry in the country for years and had thousands of people. And then he represented the healing message his entire life. And Kenneth Hagin preached faith and healing. There's just so many that you could name that did. And, they're, and they're, they're gone and they've not all been replaced. So the healing message is not getting really the, the exposure that it should and that it will. I believe it will. We're going to use technology to get the word out. <laughs> Amen. So, you know, there's people out there that won't listen to a word I say. And I could help them if they would listen. They won't listen to a word I have to say about, about faith and redemption and love and, and, and all of the things that we teach on. But if I start mentioning healing, their ears perk up. Why? Because that's what they want. And so we're missing a great segment of our population by not, by, by not using all the tools in our toolbox. And uh, man, the healing message is, is uh, it's powerful. Well, we've got one more session and I'm going to talk about how sickness is a curse and we're redeemed from the curse. That ought to settle the issue. That one verse, Galatians 3.13, should settle the argument. But uh, unfortunately, it doesn't, but we're going to go there and we're going to talk about that next.